Welcome to Business Watch, and I think the future of work is really top of mind for most business leaders, from CEOs to COOs and CIOs. Why? Well, because the pandemic has fundamentally altered how we perceive work, the ways we can work from remote to hybrid, and why we work in the first place. You just have to look around to see that nobody is exactly sure what this new future will settle down into. While Elon Musk is ordering staff back to work at Twitter and firing people while doing away with lavish lunches, some companies are experimenting with four day work weeks. Well, to talk about what the future of work means for chief operating officers in particular, who really are on the front lines here, it's a real pleasure to welcome Colony Rasmus, who's Chief Marketing and Operations Officer at Microsoft South Africa, Dave Ives, a partner at PwC, and Gabriel Malharba, Executive Manager of First Digital at uh, First Technology. So, chaps, welcome. The future of work, we are living at work mostly. That's what it feels like for me, Colin. So, maybe you could just set the scene for us here and, and what you see as, um, you know, the, the trends that are emerging in the future of work from Microsoft's perspective. It's a great question, and uh, I think there's no one answer, right? I think uh, a lot of businesses are experimenting, as you say. Uh, we talk about hybrid work being the new normal, but is it the new normal? What is the new normal? I think that's on uh, many, question, many people's minds. Um, and we really have seen it work differently for organizations. <clears throat> um, Microsoft themselves, um, we have people coming back in, we've got people working from home. And I think what is important is to figure out where that intersec intersection is and making sure that people aren't felt left out. So whether you're yeah. at the office or whether you're at home, that you're participating. And I think, uh, David, to build on that, what we're also seeing is the, the context within which South African businesses operate. You know, there's load shedding. There's all of these kinds of things to consider if you are going to be working from home or remotely versus going back into the office. How have you seen this evolve since the early days of the lockdown where everyone had to become a fay with Teams and Zoom overnight and then uh, to where we are now, where we are seeing a lot of people returning back to the office, just judging by the, the daily commute, the traffic is as bad as it was in 2019. Absolutely, and I think if you have a look at the different vectors, uh, yeah, there's different reasons why people are going back to work, but I think also people are missing out on human connection mm. and the ability to go and have a conversation with somebody and resolve things. I think it, it started definitely with, um, we, we, we're a lot more collaborative now using hybrid, you know, hybrid structures and methods, and we're a lot more afraid with that technology, but sometimes things can be resolved a lot quicker having the human interaction, and, and actually I think people are back at events, people are sharing information, there's knowledge sharing, there's contextual sharing of information, which is really important for people nowadays. Yes, we, we are affected by a number of different factors, but I think what's, what's more important is that people have the right to, or the ability to go and choose how they want to interact, and that is now a lot more flexible. So it's, not, it's, it's, more, it's more of a flexible opportunity to go and connect. Some people actually enjoy going to their customers and consulting directly with them and walking the floor and seeing for themselves what, what, what's actually going on. And we're seeing our consulting base still wanting to go and do that. Mm -hmm. And in many of the consulting firms, we were working hybridly from a consulting perspective. We're just working hybridly now at our own offices instead of our customers' offices. So that was more of a flexible environment that definitely changed for the consulting practices. But yes, we're definitely seeing a lot more people coming into the office, interacting, sharing, and, um, and using the knowledge bases and still leveraging teams and, and other methods for, uh, per, you know, for productive collaboration. Yeah, and uh, you know, what I often encounter when I chat to CEOs about their big concerns with this move to remote work was, you know, how do you culture? How yeah. do you onboard people and, and really get to uh, ensure that that glue that binds people to an organization is strong and, and doesn't weaken? And we have seen the great resignation. Uh, we'll come back to that. Gabriel, from, from your vantage point, what have been the key shifts that we've seen in, in the workplace over the last couple of years? Oh, also a good question. And I do agree with uh, Colin and, and David on the points that's been made. Um, you know, the first year of, of lockdown, I think we, we all scrambled to, to, to adopt tools and mechanisms to, to work remotely. Um, and uh, arguably, we saw a big bump in productivity uh, as a result of that, you know. And the obvious reasons were the fact that we weren't traveling anymore, the fact that we were always available. Um, and, I th and I think the thing that, that we're starting to gra uh, grapple with now and help our clients figure this out is what is the, what is the impact on, on productivity other than... Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, having the benefit of not having to travel, for instance. You know, what is, what is the, we know there's a, there's a psychological impact, for instance, now that's become quite clear. Um, but, but what is the impact, for instance, on productivity, given the lack of, of in-person collaboration, as an, as an example? You know, that's something that's quite difficult to measure. And, and I think we're starting to suspect that there, there is an impact. Um, 
And, and, and I guess from a technology point of view, uh, tools are still catching up, you know, trying to get the head around that part of the problem and, and, and catching up to address that, uh, mm. that part of the challenge. And, uh, you, you know, in, I, uh, in our industry, which is information technology, uh, arguably, yes, you know, remote working has always been quite, um, quite easy, you know, because it, 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 it is electronic business by, by nature. Um, but, uh, you know, spending time with, 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 with co-workers, um, creativity that stems from that in-person uh, engagement, um, we, we're seeing an impact on that, on, on, on productivity. So it's very difficult to measure, but yeah. it's there. Uh, and I can imagine, and Colin, to bring it back to what Microsoft sees in the data, I'm, I'm sure you've got access to reams of data uh, through the pandemic as more and more people have used Teams uh, and, and Office and, and all of the, you know, the, the platform and tools that you have available. You know, what, what from that data are, are you seeing in terms of productivity? And, and are CROs, CEOs worried about this mismatch in, in productivity? Because I feel like I'm more productive if I don't have to be you know, stuck in traffic in the morning, but I also miss that in-person interaction. You know, in the media space, you have an editorial meeting mm. and you know, the ideas that you can bounce off each other around the table, I find still far more valuable than what we can do virtually. So what is the data showing us? So there's a very interesting report I would advise people to go and have a look at something uh, that we've done over the last three years called the Work Trend Index. Um, and I'm going to go from the start to the finish. Uh, the first one that came out was quite interesting, was around this thing that we call the, the, the hybrid paradox. Mm -hmm. So people wanting the flexibility of being at home, but missing the people connection. Mm -hmm. um, and that really is very true, and we see that, we see that today. But to answer the question directly, the last work, uh, work Trend Index report suggested a new theme, which was something called the productivity paranoia. Um, and it's exactly that. So workers, employees, believe they're being more productive than what they were. In fact, that number's as high as 86%. Right. But when we ask the managers uh, or leaders of the business the same question, that, man, that number's as low as 12%. So there's quite a difference in, in what individuals are thinking around their productivity versus managers and leaders. And that really is leading to quite a disconnect at the moment. What does the data suggest? Because through Office 365 and the tools that we have, we, we, we do actually see and the data suggests that people are actually working more. Right, um, so it's more of a perception potentially there of, mm. of business leaders versus what the actual data is showing. Uh, that's fascinating, Dave, and, and to build on that, I mean, that should help guide business leaders when you think about designing the architecture of the, the workplace of the future to say that this flexibility has worked. In many instances, we are more productive, yet our employees are also telling us we want that face-to-face uh, -face interaction. So how do you balance the two? Uh, and I, you know, there's no one size fits all. Absolutely, I'm sure it's yeah. sector specific, but, but generally, how does one find the right balance? And I think it all comes down to you know, the types of leaders that, that we are employing, the types of managers that we are upskilling and growing, and the type of workforce that we're designing for the future. We've got to deal with the realities of now that we, we're sitting in a situation that there's a malaise and a misunderstanding of, of are we being more productive? Are we getting things done? And people are, are actually instrumenting more and more of their technology sets to actually understand if that's true or not. Because, I mean, I think, you know, you have to bring the data and you've got to see where things are happening in the organization. Mm. So what we are seeing is that if, you, if you're designing for your, your, your organization for the future, you need to take into account the technology, the people, the process, the standard things. But also, what are the sort of things that we need to put in place to make sure people are skilled and can use the, I mean, we've spent so much money on technology in the many, many years. I mean, all of us at home um, and many of us worldwide have gone through massive transformation journeys. And are we using that effectively? Are we upskilling people? Do we have the right security and compliance technology in place to ensure that we're doing the right things and our policies are well or uh, orchestrated and architected inside of a business? And these are just some of the you know, areas that we need to think about as we start to move into this new world of work and this new, you know, this new productivity paradox. And there's also, we know, are we ready for the sort of things that are coming? You know, virtual reality and AI and mm -hmm. machine learning, you know, giving us huge opportunities. But is our workforce skilled for that? You know, it's great to put great tools in front of people, but if they can't use them and they're not skilled to effectively make the transformation within an organization, that's a massive challenge. And sometimes that has to be done in person. That has to be done, you know, interacting over, over data, over information, over processes. And you know, you need to, you need to take a, a, a time and attention to bringing people up to the right level. And I think a lot of leaders are worried about that. You know, losing their, losing their skilled staff 
is a massive is a massive a massive challenge. But also keeping their current staff mm. and making sure that they're they're embedded in, the, in your organization and they they love the culture, they use the tools, they're passionate about your organization, and they believe that you're a responsible organization as well. Mm. So there's a whole bunch of different things coming up around things like environment and sustainability, does your organization match that? There's, there's, a, there's a plethora of things, and I think a strategy that looks at your workforce and are you future fit is a, is a, is a, is a critical thinking. And I want to stay on that for a no. while longer, Dave, because I know you've spent some time in the Netherlands, yeah. and it's quite frightening, the, yeah. the number of qualified South Africans moving over to the Netherlands, uh, just as one example, yeah. taking their family. So, you know, this ability to attract and retain top talent becomes front of mind, doesn't it? And I mean, I shared a stat around the fact that they have 140 jobs open and they could only fill 100 in the Netherlands. And that's in the tech industry and, and, and that's just a, a frightening stat. So, and, and they definitely are trawling through the fantastic database of skills and talent that we're building in places like South Africa. So it becomes a, it becomes a big challenge for us. I mean, it's, it's definitely attractive to go to Europe. I don't think so. I think the weather is definitely a detractor. <laughs> uh, and I've made a decision to, to rather you know, put, my, put my roots firmly in South Africa. And I think that also, I think we have a huge opportunity here. I mean, there, yes, lifestyle is a different thing. And, but I still believe we have a huge opportunity in Africa to make the changes, to leapfrog some of the technology challenges that they're struggling with in, uh, in Europe. And I, think that, um, and I think that we need to be very careful about um, ensuring that our people are comfortable and, and working well in our structures in here, in, in, in Africa, and also give them the same level of tools, skills, and capabilities that they don't see opportunities outside of South Africa. And that's an important piece. Gabriel, how would you how would you go about um, addressing that particular part of this future of work conversation? That is creating an environment mm. that attracts and retains the the, the top talent in South Africa. Because I'm deeply concerned about this brain drain yeah. and and the the lure of foreign currency and a potentially slightly more secure lifestyle. So you really have to think very deeply about this particular point. Yes. You know. Well, I'm happy to say that I've spent 10 years in Europe myself and, and I've returned, I guess, for, for, for similar reasons to, to David. And, and, I'm, and I'm hoping, um, you know, people in, 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 in the working industry, especially in information technology, can see a future in South Africa. Um, uh, back, to, back to your question around the, the workplace. It's, it's, it's like I mentioned when we, when we spoke about this earlier. It, it took us, you know, a good two years to take the office home you know and that, that, that was a challenge that that came with, with with challenges that we had to overcome in terms of connectivity and and consistent power etc but, but it turned out to be the easier problem to solve because now we, we we're kind of facing with the challenge of of bringing the home back into the office um, so I think it's important that we rethink about how the office is used and and when it's used and what's acceptable in, in an office setting um, you know, the gone are the days of, of rocking up at eight and, and finishing at five. That, that, that's quite evident. Um, and I think that's something that the workplace needs to consider, is to, is to make it acceptable that, that flexible hours are okay. You know, you don't have to sneak out at two. Um, I I it's okay to be flexible about where you work and also when you work. Mm. Um, and, and what is allowed in the office, for instance, um, at home, taking a telephone call to deal with a personal matter became quite normal for us because you could do that between team calls and, and not upset or embarrass yourself, you know, whatever the situation might be. And I think that's something we need to think about. How do we, how do we cater for that scenario now back in the workplace? Um, you know, is, is complete open plan still uh, an acceptable way to, to create a flexible personal working area? Or do we need to think about personal breakout areas where people can go and do their personal calls when they're in the office, similarly to what they would do if they at their home office? Yeah, we'll, we'll play a, a tape with white noise with dogs barking and hardy bars <laughs> uh, in the background. Uh, how have you done it at Microsoft? Uh, I believe you've taken a more uh, a flexible approach. Uh, just share a little bit of those learnings. Sure, so we don't play uh, tapes of hoddy dolls and dogs in the background. Uh, it's maybe a good point to go and have a look at. <laughs> um, when we looked at this, it was quite interesting, and we came up with what we call the new operating model, and we've shared this quite freely. Uh, we can go and download it, but we, we, we looked at three aspects. People, and we believe that people is now and should be at the center of what you're doing. People's well-being is so critical now because we talk about people potentially working longer 
what does that look like from a burnout point of view for individuals? We, yeah. We've got to be careful about that. Um, the one thing that we found very useful is what we would call team agreements. So even in smaller teams, when can I phone you? When can't I phone you? When do you work? When don't you work? Are you coming into the office for a meeting when I'm at home and you, you come in, you think I'm at the office, I'm not there? So just basics like that. But I think people is absolutely critical. The culture is so, so important. And uh, how do you rebuild that social capital in this new hybrid world of work? Uh, it's, it's not the same as what it was. And we, we need to think about that and we need to focus very heavily on people. The other one is places, uh, and it was mentioned. Um, we've got to think about how do you set up places, and by places I mean areas within the office, to make sure that you have got inclusivity, whether you're in the office or outside of the office. Uh, technology plays a big role there. So do I have the right camera set up? Do I have the right room set up that we make that when I'm in a room, I'm not excluding somebody that's online and vice versa? Uh, let me give you a basic example. So we all used to drawing on a whiteboard. Some of us love to draw. I'm yeah. like that. I'm a visual person. But if somebody's uh, online and on a camera and I'm standing in front of the board and, and drawing, I'm excluding them. So what technology can I use to do that? So, so small things. Mm. Uh, and the big one for us is processes, as you can imagine. How do we redesign our processes potentially? So a really basic example, if I have a paper-based process that requires signatures, it's not going to work anymore. So how do I use technology from that aspect? So that is just one thing that we looked at was the new operating model and what did those agreements look like with individuals. But I, I can't stress the culture enough. I think that is so, so important. Yeah, for some of us, we just couldn't wait to get back into the office and <laughs> away from the domestic chores that were imposed upon us while uh, living at work. <laughs> uh, but it, it also, Dave, it boils down to making it worthwhile for employees to return. You, you really have to say, well, there, there's, a, there's a proper reason. It's not just because we want you to come in and, and punch a clock. Yeah. Uh, like we used to do, it would seem very kind of industrial era uh, now that you look back on it. But uh, you really have to think, here as a CEO, what are the skills that you're going to need to to manage teams, to lead teams now into this new era? Yeah, and I think that's a, it's actually very important to think about what, is the, what does the future leader look like and what are the sort of skills they need? How do you map that out? And different industries have different requirements and different needs. I, mean, I think if you look at the CEO, I've, we, we've actually spoke about it and there's just so many dimensions to that, to that challenge. I mean, there's dealing with the financial, the operations the, and bringing all that together and, and making sure that you've got enough information to make decisions all the time and, and making sure that the people below you have the right information and tools to make decisions all the time and being able to delegate effectively. Uh, also speak about the fact that, um, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're in a leadership paradigm today, um, you need to be in a space where you hire smart and manage easy. Yeah. If, you're, if you're in a space where you're not hiring the right people and you have to go and manage them all the time, you will be overburdened all the time. So you need to have a proper strategy in hiring and thinking and capacitating your business for this, for this new organization. And if you think about as well, as like if, if, you, if you think about um, the type of people that you hire, they're also people who can make good decisions about when they should be at an office or an event or with a customer or et cetera. And those are, that's really important skills to have, is to be discerning of when to pitch up and when to do things in the right way. And also right, using the right tools in those, in those scenarios, talking about whiteboarding and skills and facilitation skills, et cetera, all important in, in this space. And convincing others and making them, making them want to come to the office is going to be an important piece. Some people enjoy the office, the office paradigm and the, you know, the informal chats and the conversations. I found myself doing with my team, we had informal coffee chats on Teams and we had, uh, we had informal gatherings just to make sure that we kept the connection. Not talking about work. I want, I want to understand I'm a human first. And that's an important. I understand what's really going on for you, and I think our, our, our workplace well-being programs are going to be absolutely critical going forward. And designing those to be um, well well instituted into the organisation that we can deal with a lot of the different challenges facing you know facing burnout and well-being. And I think yeah. those tools are going to be absolutely critical going forward. Yeah, it, it sounds like the CEO of the future, Colin, is going to need uh, you know more than one or two degrees. Yeah, to yeah. yeah. We, we had the chat. Uh, we had the chat yesterday, actually. Um, a, a quick one on the the worth it equation. You yeah. touched on it. I think yeah. that, that is so important. Is yeah. we need to figure out what worth it means for people. Yeah. So we, we actually yesterday looked at it and we said, and, and by the way, that work trend index calls us out very specifically as well. It, it, you know, it talks about the worth it equation. So worth it for me coming to work is not a policy that says I've got to be back in work 30% or 50%. Um, I'll give you a basic example. What has happened, obviously, uh, through the pandemic is people have installed high-speed fiber. 
Mm. So in some instances, uh, people are telling us I've got better connectivity at home than I do in my building. Because yeah, it hasn't, uh, uh, have to, you don't have to share it. Yeah, 100%. So, so that's, that's not worth it for me, right? I may have two screens at home as opposed to one screen at work. Um, what was very, very interesting, though, um, is that when we asked this question in the survey, the worth it equation was people. Yeah. I will come to work to connect with people. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, and you think about the culture, and you think about what you need to do as a COO um, and to build that culture, you really do need to think about the well-being of the people. But that's such a good point, because I think while you can go hybrid and give people flexibility, you may end up missing the people that you think you're going to be going in on that day to see. So there is still some level of coordination that is required yeah. in order to ensure that when you are at the office, you're there all together, the right teams on the right day. Uh, and, and you're not misaligned there. We've got about three minutes to go. So let's go around the table just with a concluding thought, Gabriel, starting with you. What are the critical success factors that we, we really need to be thinking about from people and technology and, and taking from what we've just heard about culture to get this future of work right? I think for, m for me, it's, it's about individualizing the, the options to the, to the individual. I, I think taking a, a broad stroke approach to, to when we're in the office and, and what's the policies around being in the office or working from home and, and, and whatever that might be. I think for the first time, I know we really have to think about the individual, what works for the individual um, in, in, in the context of the collective. Like you say, there are some coordination required, but you know, certain individuals are going to have certain worth it requirements and, and we're going to need to consider them on an individual basis. Yeah, mine would probably be, could I have a nap in the afternoon? Thank you very much. I'll put a place, <laughs> a, a chaise lounge in the office. Thank you. Dave, what, what, is, what is your critical success yeah, factor? So for me, I think uh, a couple of critical success factors would definitely be, you know, leadership taking, you know, leading by example and leading in this, in this, in this new world of hybrid work and, and making, for me, a policy, you know, it can either be a compliance or a policy and that's, and that's absolutely fine. But trying to force something down onto, onto your skilled labor force is a different, you know, is a, a very, very difficult challenge. I think clarity, communication, a lot of communication, clear communication, concise communication, and being, for me, I, I believe being unclear is unkind. So being clear about what's, what are the boundaries, and I think people work best within the boundaries and, and they actually understand them. And then keeping a, a team norms and a, and a strong contract basis with your teams is going to be a critical thing going forward. And then also understanding what tools that you need yeah. to bring that information and the processes together. So don't underinvest, invest appropriately. Don't overinvest because that's also not a, not, not, a, not a great way of going about it. Invest in the appropriate technology and then skill the people to use it in the most effective way to make your organization better. Yeah, the last thing you want is another shiny piece of IT kit just sitting there gathering dust where people are not making proper use of it. Colin? I don't think I can say it any better, but I'm going to come back to that people center, places, look at the places either at work or at people's houses or wherever they're working from, look at the processes. But I'm going to come back to culture. I think culture is what's going to, is going to, what's going to drive us forward. And innovation. I think we really do need to have a look. I think it's given, the pandemic's given us a, a great opportunity. We saw a massive amount of digital transformation over the last two years. We need to have a look at that. We need to have a look at how we innovate with, with, within that and how we actually move forward. Yeah, I had a, a great meeting with a bond registration attorney the other day. We did all of the, the boring compliance stuff online on Teams. So it was literally the face-to-face -face meeting was over and done in 10 minutes. And, I, you know, it's about using this technology in a smart, hybrid, innovative way mm -hmm. to ensure that we get the best out of it. Thank you very much. That was Colony Rasmus, Chief Marketing and Operations Officer at Microsoft South Africa, now with many hats. Dave Ives, a partner at PwC, and Gabriel Malharba, is Executive Manager of First Digital at First Technology, discussing the future of work here on Business Watch. Mm -hmm.